Now take your Bible, turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. So I read that passage just to say, as we sing, holy, 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 we're just singing a song that's being sung in heaven. John chapter 14, Jesus continues in verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper and he will be with you, that is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you after a little while. The world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live. You will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. The word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, and Lord, our humble prayer is this, that you give us clarity and understanding. Lord, drive deeply, I pray, into our heart and mind the truth of your word. May we respond rightly to the truth of your word, Father, in obedience to you. And this I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Marion Letaud writes this. She said, nearly seven years ago, I started a business. She said, I prayed diligently about the decision and since the Lord's direction to move forward. And because I had no experience in retail operations, she said, I depended heavily on God for wisdom and direction. She said, between the first time I caught the vision and the day we opened our doors, she said, I prayed every step of the way. On opening day, customers lined up. My heart was pounding. I became acutely aware of the fact that success or failure of this business depended solely upon me. She writes, for the next four years, I ran the store as if this was true. Instead of praying for God's wisdom or listening to counsel or of trusted advisors, like my husband Dan, she said, I relied on my own understanding. I simply was too busy. I was too preoccupied to spend time reading Scripture. And when I did make time, I found myself just rereading the same passage, not understanding anything. Daily preoccupation over my work took the place of my time with the Lord. She said, I remember reading, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you know the ending, you can do what? Nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. She said, I discovered how true his words are. The longer I skimped in my spiritual life, the further I fell from the vine. The further I fell from the vine, the more... My efforts were fruitless, making decisions apart from the direction of the Lord began to have a snowball effect, affecting not only the business, but ultimately her marriage. She said, looking back on those four years, I truly understand how you can do nothing apart from Christ. Here is a truth that you can live by. You need Jesus. People need Jesus. If you consider yourself a person at all, then you need Jesus. Another truth that you can live by is the fact that Jesus knows you need Him. 
He knows this truth. He's not surprised by our need for Him. Indeed, God has created a place in our life for that desperate need of Christ. So the words of Jesus are are critical, are critical so that our need for His presence is available to us. As He gives this great promise in John chapter 14. So let's establish the context, and many of you know the context, but it doesn't hurt to go over it once again. In the early part of this chapter, in chapter 14, Jesus once again reminds the disciples that he was going to to leave them. He said on several occasions leading up to this point, as they were entering Jerusalem for the last time, that he was going to leave them. His ultimately the week of the Passion Week of Christ was coming, and he declared multiple times, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to be killed, and then on the third day, what is going to take place? I am going to be raised by the power of God. This is going to happen. And in so doing, Jesus is preparing his disciples for what they are about to experience. He does that same thing in John chapter 14, except he gives us a little more detail. The first six verses are familiar verses to us. They're comforting verses to us. They're encouraging to us. But for the disciples, you remember that these words rock the foundation of their life. Perhaps this was a moment when Jesus allowed their ears to be open because we read in other occurrences where they were not allowed to understand. Just this morning in Mark, I read that the Lord closed their heart, hardened their heart so, they, they, so that they did not understand what He was saying. But ha- perhaps this was one of those moments. Imagine this for a moment. The person that has led you, provided for you, the person who calmed literal storms in your life, the person they trusted so much so to leave their vocations and leave their families, tells them, I'm about to leave you. I believe rightly that kind of news tends to leave, leave us a bit insecure. That kind of news reminds us of just how much we rely on one person. Of course, Jesus knew this about the disciples. And he knows this about you as well. He knows he knew that they needed him, and he knows that we need him as well. And thankfully, thankfully, Jesus provides his presence to those who trust him, who repent of their sin and believe the gospel, who believe on him as Lord and Savior of their life. That's why this passage in John 14, ultimately John 16, I believe they are so vital to the security of the believer. Now, that is a doctrine in which we believe. We believe in the security of the believer. What is that doctrine? Well, it's the truth that once a person truly repents of their sin and believes on Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, then they are indwelt by the Spirit of God and nothing can separate us from the Lord our God. It's just the fulfillment of Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate us. We are the children of God from that moment until eternity. And indeed throughout eternity. This brings great comfort to us. But through this discourse with the disciples... Jesus tells them that even though he is going to leave them, he said, I will always be with you. I'm going to leave you, but I will always be with you. So if we put ourselves in that moment, I believe we would have the same reaction. There was confusion on their part until the, until the resurrection, until they were able to see him, until Thomas was able to touch his side and see the scars in his hands. In that moment on the day of Pentecost, what then did Jesus do? Well, he unleashed 
for eternity His presence into the life of believers. Now, this isn't the first time that the Holy Spirit has come and worked in the lives of individuals. No doubt in the Old Testament, they were not indwelt by the Spirit, but the Spirit of God was present. Even at the end of the Gospel of John, he tells his disciples, receive my Spirit. And so no doubt the Spirit was present, but the Spirit was not internal. It had not come yet come to indwell as we find in Acts chapter 2. Now, before we get to verses 16 and 17, I know those are the exciting verses. And so what I've done here is I've made you stay until the sermon is over. We're going to begin with verse 18. We're going to begin with verse 18. Look at verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And after a little while, the world will no longer see me. That statement became true. The unsaved world did not see Christ in his resurrection. He appeared to disciples only. And so, they will not see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. So this, this, this section turns our attention once again to the difficult truth of Jesus leaving his disciples. But notice what he says to them. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you as orphans. Now to be an orphan is to deal with incredible loss, a great sense of loss. There is a sense in which you're all alone in this world. Jesus said, I will not leave you this way. A child is left without parents. Even in the Greek culture, for a person to have one parent die or a disciple to lose their teacher or their master, they could be considered as orphaned. Such great loss and insecurity and the feeling of being abandoned. But as the disciples, these were, these were grown men. You realize that, right? They were men still reeling from this news. And so Jesus makes this promise. I will not leave you as orphans. Now, having just read verses 16 and 17, our our minds are immediately drawn to the future coming of the Holy Spirit. But this was not to what Jesus was referring. He was not saying, I I won't leave you as orphans. The Spirit is going to come. What is Jesus looking forward to? He's looking forward to His own resurrection. That's what He is referring to. He is saying to them, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Remember the opening discussion of this chapter. Jesus points to the gathering of the church. I'm going to go and prepare a place and then I'm going to come so that you might be where I am. That's not what he is referring to here. He speaks of seeing the disciples after the resurrection. So why is that important? Why was it important for them to see him after the resurrection? Well, notice verse 20 with me. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father. I am in my Father and you in me And I in you. So let's consider the actual crucifixion for a moment. If you can take your imagination to that scene. Luke chapter 23 verse 49 reads this. And all of his companions and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance and seeing these things. What were these things that they were seeing? Well, they were seeing this man who they believed to be the Messiah of God nailed to a cross, raised upright, struggled to even breathe. They saw his body that had been brutalized through the scourgings. This is what they are seeing. And I can confidently say that the group gathered there did not cheer when Jesus died. That little group of disciples. They did not cheer when he 
gave up his spirit. They did not cheer and say, you know, in three days he's going to be raised. In three days, by the power of God, he's going to be raised again. And then everyone who repents and believes on Christ for the forgiveness of their sin, they're going to be forgiven and they're going to be saved. That was the promise to not leave them as orphans rested on the resurrection appearances because they did not yet fully understand. And so the Lord says, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. And that day when you see me, then you will know you will know that I am in my Father. My Father is in me. You are in me and I will be in you. What do those resurrection appearances prove? They prove just what Jesus said. They proved just what He promised. Jesus said, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to those whom He Wishes in that same discourse, Jesus said, For just as the Father has life in Himself, even so He gave to the Son also to have life in Himself. The resurrection appearances will give the disciples certainty, a certainty on Christ dwelling in God the Father. And so all that Jesus promised them was proven. I will not leave you orphaned. I will come to you. And when I do, then you will understand. Then you will truly know who I am. Because Jesus will prove through the resurrection appearances that He is in the Father and the Father is in Him, the disciples can fully believe that He will be in them. What great confidence Jesus gives to them. You know, there's, there's a mystic union here. There is a bit of mystery that comes with the indwelling of the Spirit of God. We do not fully understand how the God of heaven and earth is able to indwell cracked, broken vessels. But He does. There's a mystery here. In verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode. We will make our home. We will make our dwelling with him. This speaks of the indwelling Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, dwelling in the lives of those who repent of their sin and believe the gospel. Romans 8 says, however, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you through the, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead also will give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit, who does what? Dwells in you. Is in you. Friend, if you are a believer in Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, then the Spirit of God dwells in you. The Holy, indwelling Holy Spirit proves the resurrection of Jesus. Why? Because He has delivered the Spirit. And He does that because He is alive. The indwelling Holy Spirit promise, promises to fulfill everything in your life and in my life and in those who are believers in Christ that the Father promised. He will fulfill every promise. So the critical question is this. Does the Holy Spirit dwell in you? Have you believed on Christ as Lord and Savior of your life? Repented of your sin? Believe the gospel? If not, friend, then the Spirit of God does not dwell in you. 
But if he asks, then he does. Then he does. So because the Holy Spirit dwells in you, be certain, be certain that Jesus will fulfill the promises given in verses 16 and 17. Now let's turn to verses 16 and 17. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, when Jesus speaks of another helper, we need to be confident of this. We need to be confident that Jesus is not sending someone less than himself. He's not sending someone less than himself. In other words, we are not getting a substitute. We are not getting someone less than Jesus, a stand-in, a placeholder, if you will. We are getting nothing less than the Spirit of God. If we are to do greater things, as Jesus promised that we will do, if we are to take the gospel to more people, if we are to minister to more people, if we are to preach and teach to more people to whom Christ was able, then we need no less than Christ fueling us and motivating and driving us and working through us. And so the Lord has provided a helper, some texts say, a counselor, some texts say, an advocate, some texts say. But listen, friend, we need to be very clear in our mind that Jesus has not sent us a servant. He has not sent us a feel-good counselor. He has sent us His Spirit. We have to be very careful here. There are some popular folks out in California who write a lot of music and a lot of churches sing their music. We do not. We stopped it. But one of the main characters in their music ministry, Jim Johnson, has said, and I've seen it on video multiple times, it's easy to find. She's talking about the Holy Spirit, and she says, this is what I believe the Holy Spirit to be. I believe the Holy Spirit to be a genie in a bottle. And she said he's blue, and he's funny, and he's sneaky. This is what she said about the Spirit of God. Verse 26, Jesus calls him holy. The Holy Spirit. Whom the Father will send in my name. Calling him the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying something about the nature of of the Spirit whom He has sent. He's saying the Spirit is holy. He is holy because God is holy. He is holy because He came to continue the work that Jesus began in the life of the disciples to do that same kind of work. The work of the Holy Spirit is to continue to shape us into the image of Christ. And so if God the Father and God the Son are holy and righteous, and we have been sent the Holy Spirit. What is she saying about God when she says the Spirit of God is like a genie in a bottle? She's speaking less of a holy God and a holy Christ. Church, we cannot play with this stuff. We cannot be so cavalier in speaking about the Godhead. The Spirit of God is not our servant. He's none less than a holy God. And if He's to shape us into the character and nature of Christ, who is able to do that except the one who is able to do that? 
That is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit working in our life. Now the word used in the original language is the word alas, alas. The word, the meaning of the word is another of the same kind. So the Lord's words here are purposeful and they emphasize the unique work of the Spirit in continuing what He had begun while on earth without any loss of character or quality or power or intimacy. Jesus could promise this because the Spirit of God is equal in divinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus knows you need Him. Jesus knows you need Jesus. Because He knows you need Him, He's given you His permanent presence. How? Through His Spirit. And so we get no less We get no less of Jesus when the Spirit of God comes to dwell within us. We get all of God. We get all of God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And when Jesus said, I will be with you, I I will be with you, He is speaking of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in the life of believers. So what does this mean? Well, it means that the Holy Spirit is an ever-present part of the believer's life. Every believer. It means through the presence of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is present in your life. Always. Whatever you go, whatever you do, Jesus is present in your life through His Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit will deliver eternal truth to our lives. Now notice in verse 17. This is what He calls Him. He calls Him the Spirit of truth within this dialogue jesus said i'm the way the truth and life no one comes to the father except through me now centuries of religion centuries of religion have brought lies and deception and that's just before christ came but it's been after as well centuries of religion bringing lies and and deception. Jesus did not bring lies and deception. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, specifically in chapter 5, Jesus says a number of times, now you've heard from the ancients, or you've heard it said, now I say. He's referring to the lies and deception that have been given to men. And he's saying, now I'm telling you the truth. This is what the Spirit of God brings to us. The Spirit of God brings truth the spirit of god will always lead you in truth jesus said in john chapter 16 but when he the spirit of truth comes he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own initiative but whatever he hears he will speak so let's let's follow the words of christ just in this gospel In chapter 5, he said, I do not speak on my own initiative, but I speak everything, what? The Father tells me. The Father tells me. I speak what the Father says. And he says here again, we haven't gotten to this chapter, it'll be a couple of months before we do. (laughs) He said, the spirit that I'm going to give to you does not speak on his own initiative but what he hears. And God the Father always leads us in truth. So friend, hear me when I say, no one wants you to live the Christ life more than Jesus does. No one wants you to live a faithful, holy life more than Jesus does. So much so that he's given us, he's given us his word He's given us his word, which is sharper than any double-edged sword, dividing his marrow from the bone, making man, any man equipped for the work of ministry. He's given us his word, and he's given us his spirit to lead us in his truth. Now, if you have repented of your sin, and if you have believed the gospel, then the Spirit of God dwells in you. Well, preacher, I don't always feel like it. 
Well, listen, friend, you've discovered this. If you live long enough, your feelings lie to you. But the Word of God never does. Never does. The Spirit of God never will. He will lead you in truth. And God's Word says that He comes and He is the down payment upon our eternity. He is the seal of God over our lives, marking us as a child of God. And the good news is this. You can live holy, righteous life for Christ because the Spirit of God will lead you to do that. The question is, are you living for Jesus? Are you living being led by the Spirit of God? Maybe if you're honest this morning, some will say, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Christian. Out of arrogance, I've never repented of my sin. Out of arrogance, I've never thought I needed to repent of my sin. You've never repented of your sin and you've never believed on Jesus as the sinless, crucified, and risen Savior. My friend, I want to say to you, there's good news today. Jesus is still saving. He is still forgiving. He is still sending His Spirit to dwell within those who will humble themselves and believe on Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. We're going to take a few moments. There's not going to be any music playing, which is going to make everyone feel drastically uncomfortable. But in that silence, you just simply ask the Lord or confirm with the Lord, Lord, I know your spirit dwells in, within me. Maybe it's an opportunity to give praise to God because he has saved you and you've humbled yourself and you've repented of your sin and believed the gospel. My friend, maybe, maybe it's a moment when You say truthfully and rightly, Lord, I've never repented, but I want to. I want to believe on your son. I want to know him. I want to know his forgiveness and I want to know his indwelling. Is that you today? Is that you today? Let's bow together in prayer. And friend, if that is you today, then I invite you right where you are, stand up and just come, come to the front of this auditorium and we will meet you here. And we'll share the hope of the gospel with you. Would you come? Father, it's with, it's with great humility that we who are saved give praise to you and worship you because it is only by your grace and mercy that you have saved us, called us, redeemed us through your Son. For this, Father, we give praise to you. And Lord, we can believe this promise that Jesus gave to his disciples and indeed the word of God speaking to us today that you will send your spirit to indwell. Father, we give praise to you for that. 
Lord, I pray for those here who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that you will draw them. Lord, they will humble themselves before a holy and righteous God and repent of sin so that they too might know the love that you have shown us in Christ, believing the gospel. Lord, in a world that's desperate for true good news, There's only one source, and it's the gospel. Friend, if you have allowed the Lord to rightly deal with you this morning and you are not a believer in Christ, then before you leave this place this morning, do not fail to walk to the front of the sanctuary and just ask one simple question, how can I be saved? How can I be saved? Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.